Welcome to my video series on the heroine's journey. I'm Susanna Liller, and it's time to find your happiness. Today, we're going to talk about identity. I'm going to convince you that you are a heroine. Do you know that? Do you know who you really are? More than ever, we women are encouraged to step up, lean in, speak up, and we're doing it. We know it's vital that feminine voices be heard, and we are using our voices more and more. Some call this the rise of the sacred feminine, and I've been doing a lot of research and exploratory work on what the heck is that, which I talk about in my blog a lot. But today, I want to talk about our identity, your identity, and and how to believe that maybe you're more than you think you are. So let's face it, I think part of this whole encouraging us to step up and speak up, we have to deal with our confidence and we need help with our confidence. We need to have confidence in ourselves in order to speak up and share our wisdom, which is very, very much needed in today's world. So much has been written about how to be more confident. It's all useful, but so much of it is what we try to stick on to the outside of a person or ourselves, like a 3M sticky note, hoping it won't flutter off, and it almost always does. So we say, you can do this, you've got this, you're amazing. But lasting confidence attaches from within, where it can't peel off. So how to acquire that, how to build our confidence in a way so that it is with us no matter what challenges us. And I'm not talking about without fear because you're always going to have fear as you try new things, depending on how much outside your comfort zone they are. But this is confidence that no matter what, you can do it. So what if I told you that you could come at this whole confidence thing from another angle, the identity angle? What if it's about seeing yourself differently? Seeing yourself differently. What if it's about knowing who you really are? Maybe you're not seeing yourself as how you really are. Sure, I tell women, who I coach, that they're amazing, they're smart, that they matter, because they do. And I know that they do. But most importantly, I am affirm for them who they already are, who I know they already are. I tell women, they are already what they are seeking. It's inside of them as the great oak is already inside the tiny acorn, as the beautiful statue is already inside the hunk of marble. By the very nature of who they are and the life they are living, they already are powerful, full of potential and possibility. They just don't know it. They are so powerful, in fact, that they are part of a narrative a story explaining that power and how it's acquired and how it comes out that has been told and retold for centuries. Our problem is we don't know the narrative and we don't know it's our narrative, our story. And I'm talking about the heroine's journey, which has always been talked about as the hero's journey until more recently maybe in the past 25 years, um, Maureen Murdoch was really the first person to call the hero's journey, the heroine's journey. And for those of us who work with women primarily, that's what we call it. And women do do the journey differently than men. So this journey, this heroine's journey is a pattern that appears throughout literature and film that begins with a woman not knowing often begins with a woman not knowing what she's got as far as capability and potential and power. She's unaware. She thinks she's ordinary. She doesn't know how powerful she is. 
But life, and you can call it life or the universe or God or your higher power, something, your intuition sends her a call to action. She feels the need to change something in her life, in herself. So she leaves her comfort zone, whatever that is for her, and it's different for everybody, and journeys out into the unknown where she hasn't been before. Then, through what happens to her, her experiences on the journey, she discovers, wow, I am somebody. I can do this. I am a badass. Or as I would say, I am a heroine. She discovers this. How many leading ladies in film and protagonists in books start out thinking they are ordinary, even less than? And by the end of the story or the film, because of their adventures, they are extraordinary. Many characters are like this. We know this theme. My favorite example, I use it all the time because everybody knows the story of Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. But also there's Katniss Evergreen in The Hunger Games and Thelma and Louise. And there are so many other heroines who start off small and end up really big. But here's the most important thing that I want you to know, that I want you to hear today. This doesn't just happen in books and in film, but with real people too, real people, real heroines like you. Yes, just like you. You think you're ordinary, or you might, but you're not. Put yourself in the frame. You are a heroine in your own life. I know you have left, I know you have left your comfort zone and bravely stepped into the unknown where you haven't been more than once. You just have to wake up to the reality of your heroinism, that that's heroic. It's heroic to leave and go into something that's all new to you. We've always defined heroic as some big deed like conquering a kingdom or or killing the enemy, or no, let's define it differently. This is your heroinism, which leads you to be more and more you all the time. I know it's hard to believe because we're not trained to think of ourselves that way. We don't know the heroin journey pattern and how we're living it. There's a wonderful story that the author and activists all around amazing person, Glennon Doyle, tells us in the prologue to her book, Untamed. It's an example of what I'm talking about, but it takes place in the animal kingdom. It's a clear example of how training and environment make all the difference. And it is a great teaching story for what can happen to us. Here's my summary of it, and I strongly encourage you to get Glennon's book, Untamed, and read the full prologue, prologue because she tells it so much better than I do. It's wonderful, eye-opening, and inspiring, her whole book. I strongly encourage you to get that. And her website is mamastery.com, M-O-M-A-S-T-E-R-Y.com, just if you want to check her out. And you should. So Glennon and her wife and their daughters, this is the story, go to the zoo. And they meet Minnie, who is a friendly golden retriever. And they meet Tabitha, a cheetah, who was raised in the zoo. She never has experienced the wild. Minnie is introduced to them as to the people there at the zoo, in the stands, as the cheetah's best friend, as Tabitha's best friend. And people are amazed that a golden retriever and a cheetah could be best friends. But Zookeeper explains when Tabitha was a baby cheetah, we raised Minnie alongside Tabitha to help tame her. Whatever Minnie does, Tabitha wants to do, says the zookeeper. Then the trainer wants to show Tabitha's capabilities. 
the retriever's capabilities. So Minnie's toy bunny, it's a pink toy bunny. Actually, Glennon describes it as a dirty pink toy bunny, is dragged behind a Jeep for Minnie to chase while Tabitha waits and watches in her cage. Minnie runs after it. They call it the cheetah run. Minnie does it. Then they open the, the cage with a lot of drama. They count down for Tabitha to do it. They're told Tabitha gets a stake at the end of this 100 meter route. Minnie does the cheetah run, chasing the Jeep and the pink bunny. Then they open the gate and out comes the cheetah, Tabitha. Here's how Glennon writes about it and describes it. The zookeeper slid open the cage door and the bunny took off once again. Tabitha bolted out, laser focused on the bunny, a spotted blur. She crossed the finish line within seconds. The zookeeper whistled, threw her a stake. Tabitha pinned it to the ground with her oven mitt paws, hunkered down in the dirt and cheered and chewed while the cloud crowd chat clapped and cheered. <laughs> Tabitha pinned it to the ground with her oven mitt paws, hunkered down in the dirt and chewed while the crowd clapped. Glennon doesn't clap. She grieves for the caged cheetah who will never know the wild, her real environment, who will never know who she really is. She thinks she's a Labrador retriever. Even though the zookeeper explains to a little girl who wants to know if Tabitha misses the wild, the zookeeper says, no, Tabitha was born here. She doesn't know anything different. She's never even seen the wild. This is a good life for Tabitha. She is much safer here than she would be out in the wild. When Tabitha is back in her cage after eating her steak, Glennon's daughter points out that she's pacing back and forth, back and forth. And she says she's turning wild again, she says to her mother. Glennon then imagines asking Tabitha what's going on for her right now as she paces in that moment. Here's how she imagines the conversation. Tabitha says, something's off about my life. I feel restless and frustrated. I have this hunch that everything was supposed to be more beautiful than this. I imagine fenceless, wide open savannas. I want to run and hunt and kill. I want to sleep under an ink black silent sky filled with stars. It's all so real. I can taste it. Then she'd look back at the cage, the only home she's ever known. She'd look at the smiling zookeepers, the bored spectators, and her panting, bouncing, begging friend, her best friend, the lab. She'd sigh and say, I should be grateful. I have a good enough life here. It's crazy to long for what doesn't even exist. I'd say, writes Glennon, Tabitha, you are not crazy. You are a goddamn cheetah. Is it too much, dear heroines, of a stretch for you to imagine that we are like Tabitha? We are raised within certain limits and boundaries we are taught to be a certain way, and we don't know any different. And maybe you have felt, like Tabitha did, that wildness inside of you, wanting something more, but then keeping it in check with, I have a good enough life. It's crazy to want something different. I've been there. I had that mindset for the 13 years of my first marriage. Like Tabitha the cheetah, we have no clue about the extent of our pops possibilities and capabilities. I always use the example throughout history of how until a hundred years or so ago, 
women didn't know they could vote, that it was even a possibility, something to strive for, before they began to allow themselves to imagine what it would be like if that boundary came down. What a huge change in perspective that was, imagining that women were worthy enough to vote. The point of the heroine's journey is to birth you into your real self, the self you may have been holding back for so long, or maybe it's been held back by other forces. The journey helps you get past your fears. It helps you recognize the unique gifts that you have to offer, the only ones that you can bring forward. And it gives you the encouragement and confidence to be who you really are. And how do I define heroine? I say that a heroine is a woman who dares to be herself, has stuck out her neck and has taken risks, big or small. She is a woman who is willing to leap and stretch herself, coming out of her comfort zone on a regular basis to try new things to challenge herself, to do what she must do, even if it scares her, even if it scares her a lot. To quote Glennon Doyle again, and she is really known for this quote, we can do hard things. Dear heroine, know that the power to transform, to become who you want to be to meet your goals, to be successful, is already in you. It's there waiting. You are powerful. You just have to affirm it and bring it out. Believe that you have it. It will happen. It's your destiny. If you start uncovering, it'll be like the acorn and the oak tree. So you can't lose. You are like Tabitha who was born for so much more than a pink bunny in a cage. You are a goddamn heroine. 